This podcast is presented to you by Pastor Derek Armstrong and Word of Grace Community Church. For more information, please visit WOGCC.com. Chapter 12. Last week, we went through chapter 9, 10, and 11. We went through three chapters last week in teaching through the book of Romans. And the reason we did that is because coupling those together was so huge because the theme throughout those was dealing with unbelieving Israel. Now, we know that Paul is writing to the church in Rome. And we know that Paul is trying to communicate to these guys. He's saying, listen, I want you to understand, even though your church is made up of Jews and Gentiles, He said, you guys need to understand that that, that there's no partiality with God. That just because the Jews can trace their heritage and their lineage all the way back to Abraham and they were given certain promises and they were given the covenant and all these things that they look back and they have uh, their chest puffed out. They look at how they have been given the law and how they adhered to the law. God said, listen, you guys, that's not the route to salvation. That's not the route to reconciliation with God. Reconciliation with God only comes through faith in Jesus. Christ. Remember, justification is a positional standpoint. It's something that is a legal position that you and I stand on, and we receive that by faith. We're justified or made legally right in the eyes of God through faith in the finished work of the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen? And that's what Paul's trying to get those Jews to understand. Listen, you're not going to find salvation through the law. You're not going to find salvation through your good works. You're not going to find your salvation through your lineage. You're not going to find salvation through the fact that you can take a DNA test and somebody can say that you are a descendant of Abraham. He said, but you Gentiles. Now, let me talk to you guys. You guys think that because you have received Christ by faith, when you weren't even looking for a Savior, that's what Paul said in chapter 10, he said, you guys weren't even looking for help. You weren't even looking for a Savior. You were so engrossed in your idolatry. You were so wrapped up in your pagan worship or your godlessness that you weren't even looking for Him. But God in His great mercy showed Himself to you when you weren't even looking for Him. Oh, isn't that awesome? He wasn't even looking for them, is what Paul says. The Gentiles, they weren't even looking for a Savior, and still God presented Himself anyways in the form of Jesus Christ to be their Savior. He said, now you guys shouldn't think more highly of yourselves either, because you now understand that through faith, you're made right in the eyes of God. Now you're legally right in the eyes of God. And you understand that by faith. You understand Romans 1.17, the just shall live by faith. Now, you shouldn't look down on Israel who has rejected Jesus as the Messiah. Instead, you should reach out to them in mercy and not think of yourself more highly than you should. And this is what Paul was talking about through chapters 9, 10, and 11. He said, listen, you Gentiles, he said, you got grafted into this olive tree that was already established. He said, it's not you that supports this thing. It's actually this olive tree that you were grafted in and the roots are actually supporting you. He said, now you've been grafted into something that you had no business to be a part of on your own. You could not have ever earned it. You could never have achieved it. You couldn't have wished hard enough, crossed your fingers hard enough to have been grafted into the vine. But you were by faith. And now, if you're in Christ, you're Abraham's seed and you're an heir according to the promise. Now you're a part of something that you weren't a part of before and you never could have been a part of. So he's saying, you need to walk with humility and in mercy. So last week, we talked about the overarching theme of 9, 10, and 11 was mercy because God said, I continually stretch forth my hand out in mercy even though my people reject me and disobey me. He said, I'm continually stretching out my hand. In other words, God hasn't given up on you. God hasn't given up on the Gentiles. God hasn't given up on unbelieving Israel. Amen? It's His mercy that we see that is beckoning us to come to Him. And so you and I, as recipients of mercy, need to follow the words of Jesus, where He said, freely you've received, so freely give. All right, so if we have freely received this gift that we couldn't earn, that we never could deserve, then you and I are not called to be storage containers of mercy, but rather conduits of mercy. Amen? It's supposed to flow in us. We receive it, and then it flows right out of us. So whatever we're receiving from God is not for us to just tank up for our own benefit, but yet for it to truly accomplish its purpose, which is to bring glory to God, it has to keep on flowing out. So that means whatever you receive from God, it needs to keep on channeling out to somebody else because it's not just for you to go, oh, I'm so glad that God gave me all this stuff. 
Because if we think that's what Christianity is about, then we'll get this idea that God is like Santa Claus and he's making a list and he's checking it twice. He's going to find out if I'm naughty or nice. And I think that if I'm nice, that I deserve and I'm entitled and I earn all of these things from God. And I begin to look at God with this entitlement mentality. And I began to think that I have somehow become worthy or deserve something from God that's a free gift to everybody. And that we receive it by faith, not through our own merit system that we may look at. So, with that in mind, let's go to Romans chapter 12. Remember, Paul was talking about mercy in 9, 10, and 11. And talking about how God had not given up on the Jews how God had not given up on the Gentiles and how his hand is continually reaching out to them in mercy that they would be saved. And so chapter 12, verse 1, he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by what? The mercies of God. He's still talking about mercy. Paul is not schizophrenic. Paul is not stopping one thought and starting another. This is in context. That's why it's very important that you and I read the word of God in proper context so we can understand what he's talking about. So in 9, 10, 11, he's talking about mercy. Guess what? Chapter 12, he's still talking about mercy. He said, I'm begging you. I'm pleading with you. I'm beseeching you, brethren, on behalf of the mercies of God that you do what? Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually we're members of one another. So we see that Paul is emphasizing the mercy of God to this church that's made up of a melting pot of Jews and Gentiles who have now found Christ. And he's trying to set their doctrine and their theology straight because they both come from very different backgrounds. So they both have very different ideas about God. And Paul's trying to bring them together because he knows that if the church can operate in unity, that it's going to be more powerful than if each individual thinks they know better than everybody else. Think we can learn something from that today? That we should not think of ourselves more highly than we ought. In other words, what Paul is saying, listen, you guys need to be sober-minded instead of thinking you have all the answers, you Jews and you Gentiles. You guys need to figure out how to come together in unity. So what Paul is trying to emphasize in chapter 12 is unity. So the title of my message, if you're taking notes, is Serving in Unity. And you see, when we understand that mercy of God that has been freely given to you and me, it should cause a response. Paul doesn't say, present your bodies as a living sacrifice and let me give you a checklist on how to do that. Paul says, no, this is a response. He says it's your reasonable act of service. If you have the NIV translation and you're reading that, it'll say your reasonable act of worship. Because serving is worship. And what is worship, folks? Worship is a response, is it not? That's what worship is. Worship is not something that we do rather than it's something that we don't necessarily consciously just make a decision as much as it's a response to the awesomeness of God. It's a heart thing. Amen? Not a head thing. So it's not something that I can figure out, okay, how to worship, how to do living sacrifice. No, it's a response. And Paul says it's a reasonable response. In other words, Paul is saying it just makes sense. You know, it's kind of one of those things that you go, oh yeah, that, that just makes sense. In light of the mercy of God that I've just talked about in chapter 9, 10, and 11, how he's been so merciful and how he doesn't quit on you and how he hasn't given up on you. He said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you should just present your bodies as a living sacrifice that should be holy and acceptable to God. This is a reasonable act of worship, a reasonable act of service for the purpose of unity in the body of Christ. And that's what he's talking about. Even as he goes on, most people just stop at verse 2 when they read through Romans 12 or when they teach Romans 12 because that's kind of the verse where everybody likes to park, you know, not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why does Paul want us to be transformed in the renewing of our mind? What is he trying to get changed in our mind? The fact that we've been thinking of ourselves more highly than we should. Because look at what he says next. He says that through the grace that's been given to you, you shouldn't think more highly of yourself than you should. 
He's still dealing with the mind. He's still saying, okay, you've been thinking that because you're a Jew, you've got it all figured out. Or let's put it in our modern day vernacular. You've been thinking because you've been in church your whole life that you're better than other people. You've been thinking that because you've memorized X amount of scriptures or because you've had communion or went through confirmation classes or whatever you've done and however you've done it or you've been in ministry before that you're better than other people. And that's what Paul is saying. You shouldn't think more highly of yourself than you ought. He said, because you need to be reminded of the mercy of God that apart from Christ, we're all hopeless. Regardless of how good we are, regardless of how nice we are to other people. There's a lot of nice people that do nice things that don't have faith in Christ and they have no hope without him. It's not about being good. It's not about being nice. It's about where's your faith? Where's your faith? What are you putting your hope in? Are you putting your hope in your ideas? Are you putting your hope in your own way of thinking things should be done? Are you putting your own hope in in, in even outsmarting God maybe? Where people think that they know more than God? Even though we see God clearly stating things in his word and showing us, revealing us his character, his heart, who he is. But who are we as a man to think that we know better than God? Just like Paul said in Romans chapter 10 where he said, who is the the clay to say to the potter, make me this way? Who are we to say to to, to the potter who's molding us and shaping us? Why have you made me this way? I, I think I know better than you. No, he's the one that we need to put our full reliance and our trust in. And Paul's saying, you need to change the way you're thinking. Because he said, actually think soberly. Why does he say that we need to think soberly? What does that mean? That means we get drunk on ourselves sometimes. We get drunk on our ideas. What does drunkenness do? It blurs our thinking. It blurs our vision. It blurs our value system. It changes. It clouds things. And you and I can often have our vision clouded. We can have our thoughts clouded when we get drunk on ourselves. So Paul said, you need to actually change the way you think. You need to renew your mind in light of the mercy of God. In other words, your mind needs to be reprogrammed to realize that it's not in and of yourself that you are saved. It is through faith in Christ alone. It is through receiving the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, when we think of ourselves higher than we should, we begin to feel this sense of entitlement, this because of our tenure, because of our contribution, because of our position. And when we realize, however, that we need mercy, it changes that. It changes that thinking to line up with what God wants us to think. And when we read this in context, it reveals the purpose of renewing the mind. When we see this, it shows that renewing the mind, the purpose of that is so the body of Christ can operate in unity. That's what he says here in verse 4. We have many members in one body, but all the members don't have the same function. So we being many, we're one body in Christ. But we're individually members of one another. And he talks about it's important for the church to function in unity. And that's what he's talking about to the Jews and the Gentiles. Because church division always comes out of people thinking higher of themselves than they should. Always. That's where all church division comes from. It's from people thinking higher of themselves than they should excuse me think about the reason that there's so many denominations think about the reason there's so many branches of this and branches of that i know that uh, i grew up in the south and the southern baptist convention you know is just everywhere there's like you know uh, a thousand baptist churches and then there'll be like you know uh, three or four other denominations Because there's 1st Baptist, 2nd Baptist, 23rd Baptist, 24th Baptist, you know, which Baptist do you go to? And the people who are 1st Baptist argue over who was the 1st Baptist church in town, you know, so they'll put on their true 1st Baptist church, you know, absolute 1st Baptist church. No, they don't do that. That's a joke. Um, But here's the thing. The reason that there's so many denominations, so many branches is because somebody accused somebody of being wrong and got a lot of people to follow their doctrine or their way of thinking or their theology, or somebody accused somebody of being wrong at some point. And they said, we can't have fellowship anymore because I think I'm right. Instead of a lot of times those things being a spirit-led thing that could be very healthy to go out and plant more churches because we need more Bible-teaching, Bible-believing, discipling churches. Amen? Amen? We need that. But oftentimes when we think about church plants or we think about new churches, Oftentimes, we hear the other side of the story, that those things were actually caused off of division. And that always comes from people thinking higher of themselves than they should. Because verse 3 says, think soberly. See, here's Paul. He's talking about 
this unrenewed thinking. He's, thinking, he's trying to get us to think in line with the way God would want us to think for the purpose of us moving forward together. Because what happens when the church moves forward in unity? God is glorified. What's the chief end of man? For God to be glorified through us. Amen? For people to see God through us. For God's name to be glorified in our lives. If that's the chief end of man, then for that to happen, not only individually, but collectively as the body of Christ, we need to learn how to operate in unity. And not say that one piece or one part or one person is more important than the other. Because Paul said, each one of you have gifts. And you're supposed to use those for the purpose of glorifying God. But here's the thing. A fallen mindset, an unrenewed mindset, is based on self-importance. And that's the kind of mindset that divides. But however, a renewed, Christ-like mindset is one of unity and one of mercy. That's one that is thinking in line, that is presenting their bodies as living sacrifices who understand the mercy of God. Because they're striving towards unity, they're striving towards peace, they're striving, striving towards forgiveness, they're striving towards the glory of God and showing forth His glory because the key motivator is not how good they are. The key motivator is what Jesus Christ has done for them. And they see what He has done and how great His grace is. And they see that it's by grace that we've been saved, right? Through faith we've received that. Not of works, lest any man should boast, right? It's a gift. It's a gift that he's given us. And so when we have that as our focus, it should bring us together in unity to serve selflessly. To serve not just wondering what we're going to get out of the deal, but serving from an abundance of an understanding of mercy because it realizes something. That we're all on the same playing field when it comes to our sin and our need for his grace. When I go, wow, it's not that I look at someone who their life really looks messed up and I say, man, they really need mercy and grace. No, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In other words, everyone is in the same boat with their need for Jesus. Amen? Amen. We look at people who may be throwing their lives away in certain addictions or certain habits and we look at them and we go, oh man, they really need Jesus. (laughs) So do I. We all need Jesus. Amen? Amen? And we all need him just as much as the person sitting next to you. That's what unites us and brings us all together. Not that some have been better than others and God looks upon them more favorably because they didn't indulge in certain sin. No, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet in that state of being disconnected from God because of our outright rebellion and rejection of His goodness and His holiness, when we were in a state of not being able to achieve perfection in and of ourselves because we could not hold the standard of the law, the law showed us our sin and it drew us to the cross. It's the kindness of the Lord that leads us to repentance. Amen? It's His mercy that draws us to Him and it's His mercy and our recognition of our need for mercy that keeps us there. Because it continually grows my faith. It continually strengthens my faith because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. Hearing the gospel, hearing the truth of Jesus Christ. And when I realize my need for mercy, it humbles my heart. And so I don't become like a Jew in the church at Rome that would be looking at his Gentile brother who grew up in his house with idols and grew up doing certain sacrifices and certain value systems and moral ethic codes that they adhered to that were a lot more lax than what a Jew grew up with. The fact that the Jew grew up with the law and being a good person in the eyes of most people, trying to be an upstanding citizen, and then them looking at a Gentile, especially one in Rome, where all kind of filthiness and perversion was going on, and these people were raised up that all that was okay, and we go, at least I'm not like that Gentile over there. I am a Jew in the church of Rome. (laughs) Or at least it's not the Gentiles going, man, you need to realize your need for grace and your need for salvation because I have a full understanding because I receive the message of the gospel and I understand forgiveness. And apparently, brother, you who are a Jew who has put your faith and trust in the law, you don't think, you, you don't understand like I understand the mercy of God. Paul says you're drunk on yourselves and it's dividing you. You're drunk on yourselves because your mindset is, hasn't been renewed. 
because you're still thinking in that fallen pattern because you're so used to thinking that way because that's what got us in this mess in the first place is thinking higher of ourselves than we should. Wanting to know more than God, wanting to know better than God, thinking we could violate God's statute, standards, and law in order to somehow achieve some state of self-reliance. That's why Adam and Eve chose to sin in the Garden of Eden because they thought they knew better than God. The, the serpent said, what did God say? And then he said, you're not going to die. And they believed it. They believed that God had somehow withheld something good from them. And so because of that, that's a fallen mindset that you and I repeat. But the Christ-like, renewed mindset is one that strives for unity and mercy. You see, when I think about that, and when I, when, when I think that way, it brings unity to the body. And that glorifies God, and it shows His glory through His church. That His church is made up of people who were raised up with, with good moral ethics and, and, and good structure and good teaching. And then his body is also made up of people who grew up with no sense of boundaries or, or, or morals at all. Amen? People that grew up with different values, different mentalities, different mindsets. And we can all come together and the thing that unites us is our realization of our need for his mercy. It's our realization of our need for Christ that unites us, that brings us together. And then Paul says we all have gifts to contribute to help us move forward in this purpose of furthering the message of the gospel. Because remember, we're not storage containers of mercy, rather we're conduits. So for us to show forth the mercy of God to the world, for us to proclaim the gospel to the world, it comes in, we receive it, and it flows out. It's kind of this love God, love people, serve the world thing going on, right? It's we receive it and we then give it. So let's keep on reading Romans chapter 12 and verse 6. Let's see what Paul says. All right, you have gifts and they're different according to the grace that's given to us. So let's use them. If you have the gift of prophecy, then let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or if you have a gift of ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches, teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives, do it liberally. He who leads, do it with diligence. He who shows mercy, do it with cheerfulness. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil and cling to what's good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor, giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence, but being fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, being patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind. Here he is talking about the mind again. Be of the same mind towards one another or keep unity. Don't set up your mind on high things, but associate rather with the humble. Don't be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil and regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it's possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it's written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, these are the values, rather, of a renewed mind. Remember, Paul said that we need to, in light of the mercy of God, present ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable. And then he shows us what those values look like. And he does so by saying, listen, I want to show you the things that should come out as fruit of people who have their minds set on mercy. And this is what he's saying. If you have your mind set on mercy, these are the things that are going to come out. You all have gifts. You all have things to help keep unity in the body of Christ. And he said, for you to move forward in your purpose, this is what this looks like. And these are the values that we here should have. So here's some principles for us serving together in unity. We'll start with verse 5, where he talked about uh, being many members in one body, we're individually members of one another. We know we're called to walk together in unity. We know that that is a calling that he has for us because we're a lot more effective together than we are apart. Amen? Amen. <laughs> we're a lot more effective together than we are apart. And we look at all these different gifts, and we're going to go through those. But as we look at those gifts, which one is the most important, would you say? All of them? Are you sure? I mean, come on. I mean, some, uh, seriously? Of course. All of these gifts are equally important. No gift is exalted above another because we need all of them to function. 
Think about the car that you drove in today. Did you go, eh, I don't need the steering wheel thing. I don't need these gas pedals. I don't, I don't really need these tires. What if we were to look at a beautiful car like a Ferrari or Lamborghini or some really nice sports car and it had no engine? Oh man, it looks nice, but it has no functionality. It would be worthless. It wouldn't be able to move forward, would it? No. It wouldn't be able to go anywhere. Same thing with the body of Christ. We need every part functioning so we can effectively move forward. For word of grace to effectively move forward, everybody has to realize that they have something that God has equipped them with. If he has called you to be a part of this local body, that for us to move forward, he has given us gifts and he wants us to think in light of his mercy and be willing to give ourselves as a living sacrifice to move his agenda forward in the earth, to show forth his glory. Amen? He said, some of you have a gift of prophecy. What is prophecy? He's not talking about foretelling of the future here. That's prophecy in the sense of the ability to share things that are inspired by God. That God gives you a word, maybe for someone, a word of encouragement or, 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 or a word of caution or, or just something to uh, help you that would confirm something that God was already dealing with you in your heart. Giving you a word from the Lord, ability to share things that have, have God has inspired The second thing is a gift of ministry. There are people who have just a gift to serve or provide care for others where it's needed. Man, they just have a heart for that. They're naturally wired that way. Then there's those who have the gift of teaching. They have the ability to teach God's Word. And there are others who I love to hang around who have the gift of exhortation. Don't we all love hanging out with those people? Man, you're such an encourager. Have you ever said that to somebody? You ever maybe had someone say that to you? Man, you're such an encourager. I love being around you. You always encourage me. That's because God's given them a gift. Now, we also have the gift of giving. People who are blessed with affluence, who have a special ability to give in special ways to the kingdom work of God. He said, if you have the ability to give, if God has blessed you, then do it so. Do it liberally. Don't do it withholding or grudgingly. Do it liberally because that's what he has gifted you to do. Some people are just naturally wired to do that. Some people have a gift of leadership or the ability to lead people. Or maybe it's not necessarily out in a front position, but they are behind the scenes people who can help place structure to help you to move forward or to help lead. People who are gifted with that. People who have gifts of mercy or gifts of exceeding compassion for others who need. When they see uh, hurt or, or lack in the world, their hearts break. And here's the problem with these gifts that we can get caught up in if we're not careful and we're not aware of the enemy's devices lest we fall into them is that we begin to think that one of those gifts is more important than another one. That's where the church begins to divide because they don't realize that we need all of those things working effectively and all of those things often don't work all together in one person, do they? That's why we need one another, amen? So if you're wired with the gift of mercy and the mercy people, the people who have exceeding compassion for others' needs, oftentimes they will go, well, I don't understand why you think teaching is so important because I think we need to be being compassionate. We need to be reaching out and doing these things and I don't understand. And then the people that are teaching go, no, we need to be teaching and grounded in the Word of God and we need to have that. And you're both right. The problem and where division comes in the body of Christ is when people go, mine is more important than yours. That's where we get upset and we think, oh, pastor just doesn't care about people because uh, we're, we're not doing this or doing that. No, no, no. If God has wired you that way, let's go that way. But you have been given a gift. Amen. It's not all wrapped up in one person to do all these things. That's why there are many members in the body. And not everybody is going to get attracted to your gift and want to roll with your gift. Amen? That's why we have to connect together all of these pieces working together to move forward. Not that we tout our gift as the gift that's more important that everyone needs to rally around. No, it's that each part has to function to the degree that God has given it. Amen? And we grow in that. We grow in understanding our passions, how we're naturally wired, the drawing and the leanings that we have in our heart. If God has gifted you in in one of those areas, you go, wow, I'm I'm kind of identifying with that. And yeah, people that think this is important or that is important, you know, man, they don't get one mind. So I kind of get that. Kind of makes sense to me. Well, here's how I believe that Word of Grace is called to function. 
I believe with all of my heart that when people are part of this church family, I believe there is a weight that comes with a calling. I don't believe that people should just come to a church because they like the amenities that it has to offer. Hello, somebody. It's not a consumer thing. I always say this in our next move class. Many of you may have been here for this message. I put two tables up here on the stage, and one was a restaurant table, and one was a family table. You can eat the same meal at both tables, but the way you do it and the mentality you have towards it is very different. Some people come and looking at a restaurant table, waiting to be served, waiting to be catered to, not connected, not helping the restaurant at all. Nobody goes, hmm, you know, while I'm at this restaurant, I wonder if they need some help with the dishes. <laughs> Nobody says, hmm, how could I help this restaurant move forward and do better and actually become more successful? Well, you often don't sit at a restaurant thinking those thoughts. I wonder if they need a new sign out there. You know, I, I, I could donate some money to give this restaurant a new sign. Well, we don't think that way. And then when the meal's over, if we had a bad experience once or twice, what do we say? I'm not going back there. Because that's our mentality at that table. Now, over here at the family table, there's a completely different mentality. You could have the exact same meal, but the way you approach it is very differently. How can I help? How can I be involved? How was your day? There's relationship that is going on. As to where you have a very shallow relationship with the wait staff, with the cook, with the server. When you're at your house, you might be the wait staff. <laughs> and if you're not the wait staff, you probably have some role that you help to make that happen. You see, this is very consumer minded over here at the restaurant mentality. It's the consumer driven model. And a lot of people, they like that. But that's not the way we're to grace rolls. That's not our value system. Our value system is that we're a church family. Amen? Amen. And everybody that sits at the table has a role. So that's why I ask you, is this where God has called you to be? Because if you like us for our amenities, if you like us for our form, what if the form changes? What if, what if the thing that you liked we don't do anymore? That's a consumer mentality. It's not, am I a consumer? Am I partaking because of what I enjoy as much as am I called? Because if I'm called, then even during times of difficulty, I'm still going to preserve unity in the body. Because I'm called. And I understand the weight that comes with that calling. I know that I know that this is where I'm supposed to be because God has called me to grow there. And then I look and I evaluate. Perhaps if some of the areas in my local family that frustrate me or that uh, aggravate me or areas that I see a lack or a need in, maybe God has called me to either work something out in me to develop character in me or maybe there's something I have to contribute to help make it healthier to move forward instead of always looking and pointing fingers. Amen? I know that's a heavy word, but it's true. It's, it's the weight of being called. It's, it's something that helps us to stick together, something that's going to help move us forward as a church body, as a church family, not this consumer mentality. That's what's going to help us to persevere. So in a lot of churches, and, and, and I've done church this way before too, and, and, and I know you've been a part of church like this before, a lot of churches have a box, okay? This is convenient. <laughs> They have a box and they go, this is our church and this is what we have to offer. Now reach inside and pick something. This is, how, this is how you get involved here at our church. Pick something out of our box. And I don't believe Word of Grace should have a box. I don't believe that we should say, this is what we do and you have to pick out of our box in order to be connected and be involved. Because if you are called here and you're gifted and God has equipped you, then it's my job and it's our staff's job, our pastor's job to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. It's for you to find out what are you gifted to do and then allow you to be raised up and released into what you're naturally passionate about and what God has wired you and connected you to do. Amen? Amen. I'm seeing this happen in our church. This has been a beautiful thing to see people who have natural passions, things that God has wired them to do that are being raised up in this body and that are being released and people that are being qualified according to scripture and being released and, and to do what God has wired them and connected them to do. And they understand their family. They understand that idea of being connected and they understand the idea of unity. And they're the kind of people that see a need and they want to feel a need. They're the type of people that see, I want our church to move forward. So how can I get plugged in? How can I get connected? And then out of that, they begin to discover who God has created them to be and it's a beautiful thing it's a servant's heart it's people functioning in their calling 
And that's what God has called us to do. Not just to say, okay, we want to have this ministry and we want to do this this way and now we need to go find somebody to be passionate about it. No, it's what has God wired us to do? What has he connected us to? I think a lot of times churches make mistakes doing this. I think that they look at success at another church uh, that may be attached directly to a ministry that the church has. And then we go, oh, well, we need to have that because when they did this type of ministry, their church grew by 200 people, so let's go do that. And then we go, okay, we're going to do this because the church down the street did it, and they grew by 200 people when they did it. Now somebody in here be passionate about that, please, and come let us know so you can lead it. That's what a lot of people do. And then someone goes, okay, I'll do it. We'll try it if it's going to make the church grow by 200 people. And we do it, and it falls flat on their face. And we go, why is this not working, and why is it working for them? Have you ever stopped to think that perhaps God called that church to have that type of ministry or that type of outreach? And that's why they're functioning there, because God has called that person to be a part of that local congregation and raise them up and equip them to lead something that would benefit the body that God has wired them and equipped them to do. And that's where the success is attached, not necessarily to the program, but rather the anointing and the calling attached to the person that God has called to be a part of the congregation. That puts things into perspective. Perhaps success is not based off of programs, but rather calling. And people functioning and calling. Amen? Our effectiveness is directly attached to how well we're operating and what God has gifted us to do. And Paul said, when these function together, man, God is glorified and people are reached for the sake of the gospel. When this happens, when we're not worried about who's smarter, who's right, who has the best idea, who has the best agenda, but people begin to realize they're called, people begin to realize that they're gifted, and they begin to grow in those giftings, and the church is equipping the saints for the work of the ministry and releasing them, and they're growing deeper roots, and they're growing wider uh, outreach and wider arms to reach more people for the sake of the gospel, and they're glorifying God more and more because the body is healthy, and it's operating the way it's supposed to operate, and people are moving forward in love and mercy and understanding that what they're receiving that they're giving man what a healthy church that is amen and that's what paul's trying to get us to understand and that's what god wants us to understand today as his body now number three is love and kindness those are attributes of a church family and number four we're people of integrity who do things with excellence he said here in uh, in in verse 11 chapter 12 he said that we're not lagging in diligence. He's talking about doing things well, doing it with excellence, fervent in spirit, doing it fervently, doing it passionately, doing it well, doing it diligently. You see, what God has called us to do, we have to do it well, amen? You can go in someone's house and you can tell what things are important to them by the placement of where they have it. And I think that excellence is not necessarily everything being perfect because people that want everything perfect, my OCD friends out there, I know that if I were to move my podium stand thing over here, you're going to go nuts in about 30 seconds (laughs) because the balance is off and you want me to desperately move it back. And if I were to preach at this slight angle, you would go absolutely insane because that's not the way that I normally do it. And you're like, put it back, 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 oh, thank, oh, thank, ho, 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 no, I'll go ahead and put it back, chill out. Some people think excellence is everything just being perfect. That's not what excellence is. Because guess what? Things are never going to be perfect. If you're looking for a perfect church, this isn't it, and neither is the one down the street that you're thinking about going to. You want to know why? Because there's people there. (laughs) But is your natural family perfect? No. (laughs) Sometimes our frustrations often come from our unmet expectations. We set our expectations up here and we think everyone should serve us and do everything we want them to do and think all of our ideas are the best and everything we want to do is the best and we should have this and I'm the smartest person in the room and we're thinking higher of ourselves than we should. And that's where division comes from. Does that make sense? That's really easy, isn't it? I think if you look at the Bible in context, things get really simple. It's when we try to complicate it that we have all these misunderstandings and bad doctrine. So anyways, number six, we're generous with our talent, with our time, with our treasure for the benefit of others. And we're, and we're not people who get caught up in slander, but rather in blessing. 
and we're compassionate within the church as well as outside of the church. And then here in verse 16, he says that be of the same mind towards one another. Don't set your mind on high things, but rather associate with the humble. He said, don't be wise in your own opinion. In other words, don't let there be any social or economic divisions among you. It's not, oh, these are all the people who have money and these are all the people who don't. These are the people who drive these kind of cars, wear these kind of clothes, have this kind of bank account, and these are the people who don't. And so we're all going to group up in all of these little divisions that we have, and we have all of our little cliques in the church based on uh, the social aspects or based on the economic aspects, and that causes u- disunity in the church. We've seen that happen in our lifetime at some point. We've seen the division that that causes because he said, don't think of yourself higher than you should. Don't set your mind on high things, but actually associate with people who are humble. And that doesn't matter how big their bank account is, what neighborhood they live in, or how big their house is, or how small their house is, or if they even have a house. It doesn't matter if they even have a car, that you can still fellowship and you can still be connected because we each have something to offer to one another. Amen? Amen. Number 10, we don't seek vengeance for wrong that's done to us, but rather we pursue the path of peace. Man, how easy is that for us to want to seek out our own brand of justice when wrong is done to us? But see, serving God together in unity as a church starts with us renewing our minds with the mercy of God. That's the power of the gospel. It humbles us. It reminds us of our need for a Savior. And it's the mercy of God that makes serving Him just make sense. It makes it more reasonable it makes this living sacrifice thing just go, oh yeah, this makes sense. It's a natural response to serve together in unity. And here's what God has called us to do. This is what God has called our church family to do. God has called Word of Grace to grow in influence, to raise up disciples who are growing in loving God, loving people, and serving the world. Here's where that starts. That starts with us growing in the gospel. It starts with us growing in unity so we freely give. We want to pray. We want to be engaged because I understand this is where God's called me to be. This is where God's called me to be. And I want to get planted and grounded because I want to grow. I want to be discipled. I want to be making disciples. I want to bring glory to His name. I want to be operating in the gifts that He's called me to. I want to bring glory to Him. I want to bring unity to the body because I know that God has called me. I know that this is what God has for me and this is what He wants me to do, me and my family. And so you got to understand, folks, this is not a spectator sport where we come and enjoy something that's done for us. You guys been to the movie theater lately? They have recliners there in our movie theater in Sheboygan. And they have giant cup holders and there's space for you to actually, you know, stretch out. And they will deliver pizza to you in the movie theater. This is the stuff dreams are made of. (laughs) They will deliver you pizza in the movie theater. What in the world? And we think, wow, that's incredible. And we're just watching a show and everyone's doing everything for us. That's not what God has called the church to be. But oftentimes our mentality is wired towards thinking that it's a spectator sport. It's not. It's not. It's something that we understand we freely receive, so we freely give. We want to pursue the passion and what we're called to do. We want to pursue that anointing in which he has anointed us with. We want to engage and invest in relationships for the purpose of growing as disciples in Jesus Christ. We have a mission to share the gospel. This is where we're going as a church. We have a message of the grace of God that didn't give us what we deserved, but rather He stepped in and took the punishment for our sin that was ultimately going to lead us to death. But now He set before us life and death, and He says, you can choose life. Because Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and nobody comes to the Father except by me. Jesus is the hope of the world. He's it. It's not the president. It's not our elected officials. It's not your boss. It's not your paycheck. It's not your spouse. The hope of the world is Jesus Christ. 
Everyone and everything around you can fail, but if you have Jesus, you still have enough. You can still rest that I have enough. Let the world throw me in prison and beat me and take everything precious to me away, but they can't take Jesus because they didn't give me Jesus. Amen? If you're going to clap, clap. I mean, don't leave my buddy alone. You guys know the rule. One claps, everybody clap. We're not going to leave my buddy alone. If, 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 you got you to gotta go where God's called you to go. you got to be where God's called you to be. And this is where Word of Grace is going as a church. And we don't know what everything's going to look like. We don't know what everything's going to feel like. We don't know what everything, what, what all we're going to go through to get where God wants us to go. But that's not why we're hooked up with Him. That's not why... Someone would move 900 miles away from everything comfortable to come and pastor a church in Sheboygan Falls, Wisconsin. It's because of a calling that supersedes what's convenient, that transcends what's easy. That's what keeps us plugged in. That's what keeps us grounded when the winds come, when the waves come. That we have something deeper in us that understands we're called. I'm not called by convenience. I'm called to persevere because perseverance is going to develop character and character is going to develop hope and hope does not disappoint. That's what you and I are called to do. So are you called? Because if you're called, it's time to connect. It's time to jump in. Even if you've been wounded, listen to me. Especially if you've been wounded. Where do your deepest wounds in life come from oftentimes? Your family, don't they? The deepest wounds oftentimes come from family. And sometimes we look at church the same way because church is supposed to be family. And oftentimes when we think of church, we think of, of hurts. We think of disappointments in pastors. And we think of disappointments in others who have let us down. We, and, and it hurts. And it stinks. And it's not right. It's not, folks. Just because it happens doesn't make it right. We get hurt, we get disappointed, but that does not mean we give up. That does not mean we quit. That means that actually our path to healing is going to be a step of faith of us stepping out and getting connected with what God has called us to do, regardless of how I feel, regardless of the hesitancy that I have because of past wounds. Because for me to come full circle and me to grow and be healthy, I've got to get established and planted. Amen? So if you've been wounded, I'm sorry. I am sorry that you have been wounded. It grieves my heart that the body of Christ is not more focused on being in unity because of the mercy of God so we can bring glory to God. It grieves my heart. It grieves my heart to see people be wounded and disappointed and let down and they felt the sting of betrayal. They felt the sting of disappointment. But I know that we serve a God of restoration who makes all things new. And you can't sit and dwell in that place forever because the enemy would love to to get you isolated, to make you feel sorry for yourself, to make you feel like everyone is against you and you can't trust anyone ever again. But I'm telling you, the path to healing is going to be when you stand up and you step out and you get connected with what He's called you to do. That's your deepest need is calling, not convenience, not comfort, it's calling so you have to ask yourself it may not be convenient it may not be comfortable but am I called if I'm called it's time for me to step out because I'm never going to experience healing and wholeness and forgiveness and restoration that God wants to bring in my life and in my family's life from past wounds until I do because I'm always wondering who's going to hurt me next who's going to disappoint me next and I live my life in the fear of man The Bible says that perfect love casts out fear. Amen? Perfect love casts out fear. And my love's not perfect. Your love's not perfect, but His is. So that's why I have to trust in His love and go, Okay, God, are you calling me? Because if He's calling me, He's leading me and guiding me into all truth. And I can rest and go, Okay, I'm called. I'm ready to connect. I'm ready to get plugged in. I'm ready to start trusting. I'm ready to start letting down some walls. I'm ready to start getting involved and being discipled and growing as a believer. Iron sharpens iron. So does one man's countenance sharpen another. Amen? You can't passively wait for wounds to heal. It's time to step up, step out in faith. Amen? 
Amen. Amen. Man, I could talk about that for a while. <laughs> Hope you've gotten something out of this message today. Um, I would challenge you to reread Romans chapter 12 this week. Um, this has been a fantastic uh, uh, just digging in the Word of God through the series in Romans. And I'm excited about uh, getting it wrapped up too because there's a couple more chapters that I'm really excited to talk to you about. And it's going to be great. So just keep on coming. Keep on plugging in. It encourages me when I see you have your iPad or your Bible and your notebook and you're writing stuff down. Man, that's, that's encouraging because I know that you're hungry for the Word. Because it's the truth of His Word that's going to help us realize our freedom in Christ and the truth that sets us free. Amen. Thank you for listening. For more information, please visit wogcc.com.